Our story is the story of the universe. Every piece of every one, of everything you love and everything you hate, of the thing you hold most precious, was assembled by the forces of nature in the first few minutes of the life of the universe, transformed in the hearts of stars or created in their fiery deaths. These are the words of the well-known particle physicist and science communicator, Professor Brian Cox, who, like me, was inspired to pursue a career in science as a young teenager after reading Carl Sagan's famous book, Cosmos. Both Professor Cox and Dr. Sagan, with this famous quote, we are made of star stuff, share a message that resonates with people the world over. And the message they share is that as Earthlings, we are truly connected to the universe and to each other. And in the vastness of space, our existence is both significant and meaningful. In my view, much of our collective significance lies in what we do with our lives to ensure that future generations can thrive and learn more about this magnificent universe we're so incredibly lucky to find ourselves in. And to that end, I believe that some of the most important things that we can do during our time on this planet is to mentor, learn from, engage with others. We build deep connections, or bridges, so to speak, when we share of ourselves and of our own talents and knowledge and these connections not only provide a profound source of meaning in our own lives, but also give us the tools to propel our civilization forward and nurture future generations of problem solvers, explorers, leaders, and kind and compassionate people who will change our world. I'd like to start by going back to the idea that we are made of star stuff. What does this mean, actually? If you think back to chemistry class, you may remember the periodic table of elements. <laughs> As we learned in school, elements are the most basic building blocks that make up everything around us. This stage, the air that we breathe, the trees outside, you and me. It turns out that if you look at light from stars or clouds of gas in the distant universe and put it through a prism, breaking it into a rainbow-like spectrum, there are darker or brighter lines that occur within the spectrum called spectral lines. The location of these lines tells us what elements are present in the star or other bright object that we're looking at. For example, you can see in the spectrum here, there's a pattern of dark lines. And this pattern tells us there's hydrogen in the star. And we know that this pattern represents hydrogen because we've observed the same pattern of hydrogen in experiments here on Earth. So from these observations, we can show that the same elements that make up all of this stuff here on Earth are the same elements that make up everything in the universe. The chemistry set laid out in our periodic table describes the stuff in stars, galaxies, gas, and planets across the observable cosmos. The simplest elements, like hydrogen, were formed at the beginning of the universe, and the heavier elements, up to iron, are forged in the cores of stars. The heaviest elements of all, like nickel, copper, and other important metals, are formed when stars much larger than the sun die in a cataclysmic explosion called a supernova. The elements forged in the hearts of stars and supernovae are eventually dispersed out into space and coalesce to form new stars and planets like the Earth, which may go on to offer life forms like us. So we are intimately connected with the cosmos that we live in because, as it turns out, we truly are made of the same stuff as the stars, galaxies, and other cosmic wonders in our universe. If you think of any of this for too long, an interesting question presents itself. If humans and plants and animals and every living thing on this planet are made of the same elements, the same stuff. And that same stuff is spread around everywhere in the universe. Isn't it logical to wonder if life could have arisen on some other far off world? And what if that life evolved and became intelligent? Could we talk to these extraterrestrial beings? These questions may sound like stuff for science fiction, but if these are things that you wonder about, you're in good company. Scientists and philosophers and theologians for thousands of years have asked these very same questions. Finding the answer to these questions could shed a whole new perspective on our place in the universe and our connection to the universe. And although this is a question that has been widely discussed in philosophical circles for millennia, it wasn't until the 20th century, 1960 to be precise, that someone actually applied the scientific method to search for intelligent life elsewhere. And that someone was a young astronomer named Frank Drake. Drake had just finished his PhD at Harvard and came to work at the newly established National Radio Astronomy Observatory in lovely Greenbank, West Virginia. <laughs> the observatory it was an exciting place then as it is now, with new telescopes being constructed all the time, spindly metal structures poking up among the Appalachians. Not long after Drake began working at Green Bank, he read a groundbreaking paper published in 1959 by two scientists named Giuseppe Cacconi and Philip Morrison called Searching for Interstellar Communications, which proposed that a way to scientifically search for alien life would be to search for radio signals transmitted by advanced civilizations out there in the universe. Kokoni and Morrison ended their paper with a powerful quote. 
The probability of success is difficult to estimate, but if we never search, the chance of success is zero. Drake took that as a challenge. He cooked up an idea to use the 85-foot Tatal Telescope in Greenbank to search for ET, pitched it to his supervisors, got the idea approved, and thus Project Ozma, the world's first ever search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, project was born. SETI took off as a scientific discipline in the years to follow, as did its sister science of astrobiology, the search for any kind of alien life, intelligent or not. Not quite two decades after Ozma, during the 1970s, twin spacecraft Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were launched out into the depths of the sun's realm to make close flybys of the outer planets. The thing that I find particularly fascinating about the Voyagers is not just their incredible contributions to science, but also a message that they carry with them. Attached to each Voyager spacecraft is a golden record containing a collage of the sounds, images, and music of Earth. A team of scientists, artists, writers, and engineers created this record of Earth's greatest hits to send out into the unknown depths of space. This endeavor was fueled by the yearning that some extraterrestrial being somewhere out there might find one of the Voyagers millions of years from now and be able to decode the contents of the record and learn something about these beings who sent out this spacecraft in an early attempt to get our cosmic bearings. To me, the act of assembling this tribute to Earth was an act of incredible hope in the face of long odds. The Voyagers, along with their golden records, have traveled beyond the solar system and into interstellar space, well over 10 million miles from home, taking their message with them to represent Earth's best foot forward. As a species, we desperately want to find out who's out there. In commencing the search for ET and in reaching out to the depths of space with projects like the Golden Record, we've embarked on an epic journey of self-discovery as well. To me, that is why SETI and astrobiology are so vital as a human endeavor our hope of finding some other civilization out there who has experienced the struggles of being conscious and who has succeeded and gone on to become extremely advanced reflects our hope for the future of humankind. Whether we find advanced life out there or not, the search will have been well worth it because in looking for life elsewhere and pondering what is possible, we are really coming to understand our own civilization as it is now and as we hope it will be in the future. So how do each of us now work to realize the most fantastic and wonderful hopes and dreams that we have for humanity's future? We can do this by fulfilling what I think are some of our most important roles as human beings, that of being both a mentor and a student. We occupy both of these roles simultaneously throughout our lives. For example, when we're babies or small children, while we're learning so much ourselves, we're also teaching our parents, our siblings, important lessons about life. And of course, as we grow, our ability to be mentors grows as well. On the flip side, we're always learning, whether we know it or not. We can learn from everyone, from our children to our teachers and everyone in between. As a student, I've ex seen and experienced firsthand the wonderful outcomes that arise from student-mentor interactions. From the time I was born, my parents and later my brother have been my mentors. And growing up, I've had the good fortune of learning skills from a variety of wonderful teachers and leaders in my life. I'd like to talk particularly about an experience that I've had over the past several years that's profoundly changed my outlook and way of life, working as a student intern at the Green Bank Observatory. When I was 16, I had the amazing opportunity to work with astronomer Dr. Richard Prestige on a summer research project with the observatory. I spent the summer working closely with Richard, and from him I learned way more than I could ever have learned on my own. He taught me the tricks of the trade of radio astronomy, patiently explained very difficult technical concepts and explained them again when I didn't get them the first time, G gave me advice based on his own experiences with project management and time management that stay with me to this day. And he always kept the big picture of why we do astronomy at the front and center of his teachings. In addition to the things that Richard taught me, working with him impacted me in another way too. He became a good friend and was someone I could turn to if I needed advice on tough decisions related to my future goals, how to run this Python script, or importantly, about the finer points of settlers of Catan. <laughs> Richard impacted the lives of so many students, just as he impacted me. Sadly, the world lost Richard this past summer, and with him it lost a brilliant scientist and incredible person. Richard was a phenomenal radio astronomer, but he was truly amazing because he cared. He cared deeply about his students' futures, our well-being, and he showed that in the way that he respected us and challenged us each and every day to meet our full potential and never stop learning. Although Richard has passed on, his work remains alive with all of us. By being a mentor, we can, in a way, live forever. Our dreams can carry on beyond ourselves and impact the next generation. And because of Richard, because of the Green Bank Observatory, I've determined that I'm completely passionate about pursuing a career in astronomy, and I've learned a foundation of skills I'll need to make a difference in the field. 
I'm telling this story because I think it is a beautiful illustration of the impact that a caring mentor can have on a student's life. Stories like mine and Richard's happen every single day at places like right here at Marshall University and at the Green Bank Observatory. Despite the observatory's remote location in rural West Virginia, thousands of students come to the facility for camps and day trips every year, participate in the facility's world-renowned educational programs, and have their own experiences working with and learning from mentors who are experts in their field. One project that Richard and I and several other students, educators, and re researchers started in collaboration with the observatory is an initiative called Open Source Radio Telescopes. And the goal of that project is to make designs and kits for simple backyard radio telescopes available to students across the world. From that project, I've had the opportunity to feel what it's like to be a mentor as well. And I found that working with students is not only a joyful experience, it inspires new ways of thinking about things. There's not one time that I've spoken to a group of students and one of them hasn't raised their hand with some intriguing question or insightful comment that brings to light something I'd never thought of before after working on something for months. <laughs> So the student-mentor relationship is entirely symbiotic and benefits both students and mentors completely. If every student had the same experience of having a caring mentor, of feeling like a part of something, of finding an area of work that they're passionate about and want to make a difference in, and if every mentor had the experience of working with a student with a fresh outlook and new ideas and feeling reinvigorated to rediscover their own enthusiasm for their work, then there is no limit to what we as a society of mentors and learners could accomplish. And that is how I think we can secure a bright future for our and future generations, by being open to learning from each other, by actively mentoring each other, and by putting effort into showing kindness and sharing knowledge and joy with those around us, we can work together to find solutions to the big problems that threaten us today. Let's wrap up by revisiting the topic of SETI one more time. Today, the Green Bank Observatory is still a big part of SETI's story. The field is young and there's much searching left to do. We've searched but the tiniest fraction of places we could look for life out in there in the universe. But up to now, Earthlings are the only life forms we know of, the only beings capable of thinking about our place in the universe and the meaning of our individual lives. So if it turns out that we are the only civilization in the galaxy, it would be horribly irresponsible to allow our inability to work together to destroy this amazing planet full of beautiful living things, our precious reservoir of meaning and hope in the vastness of space. So it's our responsibility to take action in our own lives, using our own individual talents, to nurture our students, our children, and ourselves, so that we might have a chance at a bright future for our community on Earth. It seems appropriate to end with a few words from Carl Sagan. We speak for Earth. Our obligation to survive and flourish is owed not just to ourselves, but also to that cosmos, ancient and vast, from which we spring. Thank you.